thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened, and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction, let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not in the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief. And their sleep is taken away, unless they, have caused, unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. You may sit down. We are gathered here with joy this morning on this occasion. Give a special welcome to the family and friends of those who will be baptized, supporters, each of you that are here, and we welcome you in the name of Jesus. And a special welcome to the class, those of you that will be baptized here this morning. And God bless you during this time, uh, milestone in your lives. We rejoice with you. The title of the message this morning is The Path of the Just. And I'm wondering, as Dave read the text, if you thought about the references in that passage to the way, the path that we are walking. I may just point a few of those out to you before we move on. This is not necessarily the text for a message, but we're using it as a springboard. If your Bibles are still open to Proverbs chapter 4, notice verse 11. It says, I have led thee in the right paths. Verse 12 says, when thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. When thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Verse 14, enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Verse 18, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more onto the perfect way. Verse 19 refers to the way of the wicked. And then if we drop down to verse 26, again it says, Ponder the path of thy feet. This passage emphasizes that the path you choose to walk is very important. It's a significant decision that you make. And why is that path so important that you walk? Well, your path leads to your destiny. And not every path takes you where you want to go. Some of you may have remember, may remember uh, John U. Lapp illustrating the fact that you have a choice and you may choose the path that you want to take. And if you choose your path, when you get to the end, you will need to accept the destiny to which that path leads. Or you may choose the destiny at which you want to arrive and then you will need to choose the path that leads to that destiny. And that's true for each one of us, not just for the young people this morning, not just for those who are teenagers or younger, it's for every one of us. Because from the place where you are standing this morning, there are many paths that you can choose that lead in all directions. And some of those paths are more attractive than other paths. Some of them may not have so much appeal. And our tendency is to consider the path rather than the destination to which it leads. Now you, those of you here in the front this morning, you have made a decision concerning the path that you're choosing to walk. And I commend you and I affirm you in that decision that you've made. And you are here today to give public testimony to that decision before God and before all those people gathered here. And your decision, I believe, is based on the destiny rather than the immediate appeal that is before you. I know that for some of you, standing up before 300 people and giving your public testimony does not have a lot of appeal. But you are looking at the destiny that this path leads, and I encourage you in that. So as we consider our path there are two decisions we need to make. First of all, there's a decision on which path are we going to walk. 
And then when we make that decision, the following decision is when we are on that path, how will we walk as we walk that path? Romans chapter 6 talks about being baptized into Jesus Christ. And verse 4 says we should walk in newness of life. And the focus of the message, the sermon this morning, is how we as believers, as new believers and as older believers, how we should walk as we are on the path that we have chosen. And it's been a privilege and a joy for me to spend the time with you that were in instruction class in the last months. And it's a privilege to preach here this morning, but I don't want you to look at this as a message from me. I want you to look at this as God's words for you. We'll be looking at God's direction from his words. And I pray that God's word will speak to you this morning. We will look to the Heavenly Father. I would like to invite each of you to turn to the book of Ephesians. And we're going to be looking at the Christian's walk, various aspects of our Christian's walk that are mentioned in the book of Ephesians. Now, the Bible refers to our walk in numerous places, and I have chosen to stick, for the most part, um, with the ones that are mentioned in the book of Ephesians. And the first one I'd like to look at, the first point, is walk in good works. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Walk in what? In these good works. So the first point of our walk on the path of the just is that we walk in good works. Now, I'd like to emphasize that we are not saved by our good works, but we are saved unto good works. And that is emphasized in this passage. Uh, verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of your works. It's not your works that saves you. It is the gift of God. And again, it says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. That is where our salvation comes. From God's work. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Not saved by our good works, but saved unto good works. As we walk this path, we need to walk a path of good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are saved not by our works, but saved unto works. Now, faith in God equals obedience to God. And obedience to God equals good works. So we could say that faith in God equals or leads us to good works. You know, there needs to be a connection between God and my life. I'm an impotent God, and me as a mere human on earth, there needs to be a connection. What is that connection? I would like to say that that connection is my faith in God. You see, the question is not, how big is God? Because we know that God is big. The question is not, is God able? We know that God is able. But the question is, am I connected to God? Is there a connection between me and God? That connection is faith. I'd like you to, as an illustration for that, picture a tractor and a wagon. Picture a large tractor and a small wagon. The tractor represents God, the power of God. The wagon represents your life. Now, there's no question if the tractor has the power to pull the wagon. The tractor has the power. That is not the question. The question is, is the wagon connected to the tractor? If not, it makes no difference how much power that tractor has. And if you are not connected to God, what power will God's, or what, what um, influence will God's power have in your life? And I picture faith as the hitch pin that connects the wagon to the tractor. When you drop that pin through the wagon tongue into the drawbar of the tractor, now there is a connection. Now when the tractor moves, the wagon moves with it. Wherever the tractor goes, the wagon goes. You see there's obedience. There are good works. Now there is something coming forth from that wagon. There is motion. 
And when you put your faith in God, it makes the difference in your life and in your walk in life. Things begin to happen. You begin to go places with God. God moves and you move with him. And I think that prospect should excite us this morning. The fact that we can move, we can be connected to a powerful God. And that is what's going to produce the works in our life. You, you see, beforehand, the wagon could have said, well, I believe in the tractor. I believe there's power there. But that wagon is merely an inanimate object until it is connected by faith. So faith in God equals obedience to God. When God leads, you follow. That's what it means to walk in good works. So faith in God equals obedience to God. Obedience to God equals good works. People will recognize us as God's children by our good works. Jesus said, ye shall know them by their fruits. That is what workmanship is all about. A quality craftsman is known by the work that he produces. And I ask you the question this morning. Is God known, is God recognized by the work in your life, the work that he has done? When people see your life, when people see how you're living, do they see God? Will they recognize God at work in your life? So the first part of our walk with Christ is to walk in good works. I'd like to move now to chapter 4, look at another walk. We need to walk worthy of our vocation. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now, a tradesman obviously needs to possess certain skills. Can you imagine someone applying for a job in a cabinet shop? And uh, maybe the first day he gets on the job and someone asks him to measure a piece of wood. How, how long is this piece of wood? And he gets out his tape measure and he looks at it a little bit. And he says, well, it's 16 inches and three of those little marks, whatever they are. You know, he has to have a certain skill. He needs to know how to measure or to read a tape measure. Or what about someone who would apply for a secretary job, doesn't know how to type? An accountant who doesn't know how to work with numbers, to add and subtract. You know, there are certain skills that go along with a trade. Paul tells us here as Christians that we need to walk worthy of our vocation. I'd like to ask the question, what is your vocation? What vocation is Paul talking about? What trade is he talking about? What profession? Sometimes we refer to our trade as our profession. Well, I think we get the answer to that question in Hebrews chapter 10, where it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. As Christians, our profession is our faith in Jesus Christ. So the vocation of a believer is to express his faith in God. How are we going to do that? The very next verse in Hebrews says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So here we come back to those good works again. It's starting to sound familiar. It's one of the skills of your profession. And the other is love. The skills of our profession is lo are love and good works. I would like to say that love is the motivation for what we do. And then the good works are the expression of that love. Our love for God and the love of God flowing through us is what motivates, is the motivating drive in our profession, in our walk with God. And then our good works are simply the expression of that motivation. So a tradesman needs to possess certain skills. As a believer, as a Christian, we need to possess certain skills. And the two that I mentioned here are love and good works. Furthermore, a tradesman needs to use his skills. After all, what good does a skill do you if you do not use it? A worker who does not use his skills is not worth a whole lot. By the same token, a Christian who says, well, I have love, but does not walk in love, does not show that love, 
What love, what worth is that love to him? Faith without works is dead, James said. So a skill that is not used is not worth much. A tradesman needs to teach his skills. Notice this verse in Hebrews we read. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good work. So it's not sufficient simply to have these skills. We need to show and teach those skills to others. On the job, in the workplace, a worker who is able to teach and to motivate other workers and stimulate them to a higher level of performance is a valuable worker. That is a worker who is worthy of his vocation. This is true on the job, but it's also true in the Christian life. So as we walk worthy of our vocation, we need to not only use our skills, but we need to be willing to teach our skills to others, to those around us. And there's something else about our skills. A worker needs to sharpen his skills. And perhaps some of you are thinking, well, okay, so what if I don't have these skills? If I don't have the skill of love, if I don't have the skill of good works, does that mean I can't be a Christian? Does that mean I cannot be a believer? God gives on the job training. He will receive you, and he will train you on the job. One time I had a job interview, and the person that was uh, speaking to me made this comment. He says, we like to hire people with no experience, because that way we can train them the way we want them. And God is willing to accept you without experience, but he wants to train you. He wants to develop that in you. He is eager to train. Now, that same employer that I was talking to went on to say, after several months, we will have an evaluation, and we will look at how you're doing. And he didn't really say it in so many words, but the connotation was, if you don't learn, you're out of here. We'll teach you, but you need to be willing to learn. And as a believer, we need to be willing to learn. God anticipates progress. We never reach the point where we can no longer improve. So let us walk worthy of our vocation. Allow God to give you on-the-job training. Make it your goal to continue to grow in your walk with him every day. Let's look at the third walk. Move now to chapter 5 and verse 2. Walk in love. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that what we were just talking about? We see this same tendency following through. It was one of the skills of your vocation. Remember, love and good works. Now we are told to walk in love. So this is not just simply an on-the-job performance issue. This is a lifestyle. This is day in and day out. God is looking to us as his children to walk in love. Why should we walk in love? Well, first of all, we are recognized by our walk. We are recognized by how we walk. When I grew up, or when I was a young child, we lived in an old farmhouse. And I can still picture, as a youngster, being sent to bed, perhaps earlier than some of the rest of the family. And I can still remember lying in bed and hearing other people come up those old wooden stairs. And I could tell who was coming up the steps simply by listening to their footsteps. I think some of you can identify with that. You hear someone walk, and you know if this is dad, or if it's mom, or if it's a brother or sister, simply by the way they walk. And you too will be recognized by the way you walk, as you walk the Christian life. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love one to another, let us walk in love. Are you recognized by your love for others? Are you recognized in the community as a loving, caring person? Or are you recognized as someone that doesn't care a bit about others. What about at school? What about at home? You were hoping I wouldn't mention that one, right? Do your brothers and sisters recognize you by your love? Or do people say, well, you know, I thought he was a Christian, 
but I'm really not sure. He doesn't, he doesn't walk like one. I don't recognize his walk. Or do they say, you know, I can't really see that person's face. I can't recognize him, but I can tell by his walk who he is. I can tell that he's a Christian. People will recognize you by your walk. Don't leave people wondering who you are. Walk in such a way that they can recognize you, even from a distance, if they can't see your face. I can tell by how that person is walking that he is a Christian. So we are recognized by our walk. But more than that, we will be remembered by our walk. A number of years ago, when our family was living in Romania and our children were quite young, I remember one particular day, uh, I don't know exactly what the children were doing. They were kind of shuffling around there and um, shuffling around in a rather unique way. And I overheard one of them say to the other, I'm walking like Grandpa walks. You see, Grandpa's circumstances left him with a, a very peculiar walk, a particular gait. And his grandchildren noticed that. They liked their Grandpa. And even though they lived 5,000 miles away from their grandpa, they looked up to him, and they wanted to walk like grandpa walked. People will remember how you walk. They will remember you by your walk. Will they remember you for your love? By what do you want them to remember you? And when people imitate you, what aspect of your life will they imitate you? Remember they will remember you by your walk. Perhaps there are some aspects of your walk that you may need to change as you think about people following in your footsteps. We are also reminded how we should walk, how we should walk in love. We are told to walk in love in Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love, but then Paul reminds us how we need to do that, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given us for an offering and a sacrifice to God. As you walk the path of the just, remember there is no sacrifice that is too great. Christ gave everything he had for you. God gave the best he had for you. Is there any sacrifice that is too great for us to give for him? or for others, let us walk in love. Let's move on to chapter 5 and verse 8, and we'll find another way we need to walk as we walk the pathway. Walk as children of light. Chapter 5, verse 8 says, For ye sometimes, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We need to walk in light. And we need to recognize, as we think about walking in the light, that we were not necessarily born in the light. We did not start our life in the light. We were in darkness. That's what this verse says. For ye were sometimes, that means that at one time, ye were in darkness. That's where we come from. Isaiah 9-2, another verse. P part of that verse says, The people walked in darkness. They dwelled in they dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Do you know what it's like to walk in darkness? Walking in darkness is not pleasant. A number of years ago, I visited a cave. And uh, as we were touring that, ca that cave, our guide told us a story. He said one time he was preparing to lead a group of visitors into the cave and just as they were enter, about to enter the cave, someone drove into the parking lot, came running up to them, and said, are you going to go into the cave? He said, yeah, we're planning to. Do you show total darkness in the cave? Well, we usually do. Well, can I go with you? Well, you need to go get your ticket, and then you can come along. Will you wait for me? Yeah, we'll wait. And he thought this young man seemed a little bit peculiar, but he wasn't quite sure what it was about. So he went and got his ticket. And uh, he joined them in their group, and they were touring the cave, and the guide was telling them about different aspects of the cave. And after a while, he said, um, okay, now I'm going to turn the lights off and let you experience some total darkness. He said, as soon as he said that, this young man just stepped off to the side a little bit. And what happened, this young man was wearing glow-in-the-dark shoelaces. 
And as soon as he turned the lights off, this man started jumping up and down, and his shoelaces started flopping in the dark. And there was one woman in that group that simply went hysterical. She saw those flashing whatever it was over there, and all she assumed was that there was some monster lurking in the darkness that was about ready to devour her. And she could not wait to get out of that cave. She was, she was simply lost it. You see, living in darkness can be terrifying. And we hear testimonies as people share their testimonies of what it was like before they were a Christian, as they were in darkness, and any little abnormality would terrify them, and they would lose it. That's what it's like to walk in darkness. But that's not where we're left as Christians. We are in the light. We were in darkness. We are in the light. Let's look at the next phrase of Ephesians 5.8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. This is a tremendous change. You were in darkness. You are in light. Isaiah 9.2, again. Let's look at the remainder of the verse. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. So if you were in darkness, we are in the light. What is the encouragement of this passage? Not only simply to think about where we are and where, where we were and where we are, but look to the future and determine that you will continue to walk in the light. And this verse, Ephesians 5.8, brings out all three steps. For ye were sometimes in the darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk, or continue to walk in the light. Walk as children of light. 1 John 1.7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. We have fellowship with God as we walk with him as he is in light. Fellowship with each other. Now, I would just like to encourage you, especially as young people, but each one of us, as we walk, there are times and there will be times that we stumble. There will be times that we fall. And our tendency, when we blow it, as it were, when we stumble, when we fall, our tendency is to run back into the darkness. Our tendency is to hide in the darkness. But Paul's encouragement to you here is, you are in the light. Walk in the light. Continue to walk in the light. I'd like to consider the words of Jesus in John 3 as he was meeting with Nicodemus. He says, this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. Now that is not the condemnation. The next part is, that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And sometimes we're like insects. When you pick up a rock and they're exposed to the light, they just scramble for the darkness. When our evil deeds are exposed, we scramble for the darkness. But let us not fear the light. Let us follow the light. Jesus went on to say, Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest. Let us continue to walk in the light. Well, does Paul have any more advice for us in the book of Ephesians? Let's go on to chapter 5 and verse 15. There's another walk that is mentioned here. We should walk circumspectly. What does it mean to walk circumspectly? See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Well, let's just look at this word a little bit. The first part of the word is circum, and that means around. You think of circumference. You measure the distance around something. So circum has to do with around, and spect, as we know, has to do with looking at something. A spectator is someone who watches something. So what Paul is saying here, walk circumspectly, you are supposed to walk looking all around you. Look around you as you walk on the path of the just. 
Now, why should we look around us? What should we be looking at? Sometimes we're told, well, don't worry about the people around you. Keep your eyes on Jesus, and that is true. But there are some reasons why we need to look around us. One is to protect what you have. I recall taking scraps out to the chickens, and sometimes I would enjoy, rather than throwing the whole pan of scraps down, just throwing one scrap down at a time. And one chicken would grab it, and all the other chickens would come running. That one chicken was concerned that he was going to lose what he had. So instead of eating it, he'd run all around through that chicken group, just trying to stay away from the other chickens that were trying to steal what he has. He was looking where those other chickens were. I guess you could say that chicken was running circumspectly. He was looking around him at all those other chickens. And the truth is, Satan is going to try to destroy. He's going to try to steal what you have. He's going to try to take your peace. He's going to try to take your love, your joy, your fellowship with the gospel. He's going to try to steal the truth from your life. He's even going to try to steal your salvation. Let us walk circumspectly to protect what we have. Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter 4, Jesus gave the parable of the sower and the seeds and where he, those seeds fell. And he mentioned that the seeds that are fell by, the, fell by the wayside, these are they where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the seed that was sown in their hearts. Let us walk circumspectly to not lose what we have. And there's another reason why we need to walk circumspectly, and it's to avoid the sting of death. I remember as a young boy running barefoot through the grass, and it so happened that Calvin Lapp did not live near to us when I was a little boy, and our grass was full of clover flowers. And where there's clover flowers, there are bees. And bees and barefoot boys don't get along so well together. And I learned to walk circumspectly as I walked through the grass. I would look where I was going because I knew that stepping on a bee was not a pleasant experience. So we need to walk circumspectly to avoid the sting of death. Now, we might not be walking through a clover field this morning. We're walking through a minefield. It's worse than just simply a bee sting. Some armies, when they're at war, they plant explosives, hide them in the sand or under the growth or whatever, so that when someone steps on that, it explodes and in this way, they destroy the enemy. Christian life is walking through a minefield. Satan has all kinds of explosives planted in your pathway. That's why you need to walk circumspectly. His intent is to blow you away. Your intent is to be alert, to be watchful, to be aware Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says to the Galatians, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God on to another gospel. Let us not be removed from the gospel of Christ. Let us walk circumspectly so that Satan cannot destroy us. Now, I'd like to move on just a bit as we work towards a conclusion here, move on just a little bit from the book of Ephesians, I'd like to look at Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, where we see the words, walk with me in white. This is what we have to look forward to. So far, the first five points was how we walk here on the earth. In the letter to the church at Sardis, John wrote, Thou hast a few which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, I notice that each of you six young people this morning have chosen to wear white. I think that's beautiful. I think that's appropriate. 
I think it's representative of that day that you have to look forward to when you will stand in the presence of the one that you are confessing here this morning. Do you look forward to that? Do you look forward to walking with him in white? Today, you are confessing Christ in faith. Someday, you will stand before him and your faith will be sight. As you follow the path of the just, as you walk faithfully in good works, as you walk worthy of your vocation, as you walk in love, as you walk in children of light, as you walk circumspectly, you can anticipate and you can look forward, each one of you can look forward to walking with him, side by side, perhaps hand in hand, dressed in dazzling white throughout eternity. Dear friend, walk faithfully. Throw aside the weights that hold you back. Be mindful of your destination. I'd like to close with just a bit of a personal word from 3 John, verses 3 and 4, where John says, I rejoice greatly that thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now, those of you getting baptized this morning, most of you are not my children. I have the privilege to call one of you my daughter. But even though you may not be my child, we spent a lot of time together in the last months. And you're special to me. And I want you to know that I'm going to be watching you. I'm going to be watching how you walk. I pray that you will walk in God's truth because so much of what the world has to offer is not truth. The world will try to deceive you and the world will try to lead you off the path of truth. Follow the path of truth. Follow the path of the just. But you know, I'm not the only one that's going to be, walk, be watching your walk. There are other people here who have invested a lot in your lives. I think of your parents, your grandparents, perhaps brothers and sisters, school teachers. These people will be watching you. Don't let them down. Don't disappoint them. But most of all, you have a heavenly father who invested more in you than anyone else that's here this morning. And he will be watching your walk every moment of every day. He will be watching the path that you choose to walk from here forward. Don't disappoint him. Walk in truth. And don't give up until you've reached your destination at the end of the path where you can walk with him in white through eternity like to close with a prayer, and I'm going to invite you, if you're able, if it's convenient where you are, to kneel with us for prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. Thank you for the privilege we have to be gathered together here in your presence with you. Thank you, Lord, that you walked the path before us. You came to earth to give us an example. Not only to give us an example, but, Lord, I thank you for the path of suffering and love that you walked so that we can walk with you in newness of life. Lord, I pray that you would be with these six young people here this morning especially as they continue their journey with you that each day they would place their hand in yours and walk the path that you lay before them. Lord, I pray that each one of us could be gathered together in your presence and walk with you in shining white throughout eternity. Thank you again for this blessed privilege. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I appreciated uh, various parts of that sermon. I think the part that was especially striking or outstanding to me as I uh, thought of it was the part about walking in light. Uh, I can find myself um, feeling a challenge in that way and how that when there are areas in our lives that are not as they ought to be, we're sort of like the little critters that are under the stone. When the light is exposed, we, uh, yeah, we, we uh, try to um, defend ourselves or try to get to a place where, where it's uh, more comfortable for us. And uh, I think as Christians, the command there is to walk in light. And I think one of the things that is implied there is that um, we're comfortable or okay with being transparent. <laughs> And that way we, uh, yeah, we exemplify Christ in our lives. I also um, yeah, just uh, appreciated the visual, the uh, picture that uh, Nate used uh, at the beginning and the end there. And see the sun rays coming down on the path. And um, today is probably one of those days where um, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, excitement or enthusiasm that especially those that are baptized feel. And it ought to be that way. And, but if you looked at the picture just a little bit ahead of the rays, the path curved and you couldn't see um, beyond that curve. And that is so illustrative of our lives. And you know, it's, it's good that we can't see too far ahead. We like to see at least a little ways ahead. But the lesson that we need to learn is that we need to walk with God, and he sees the end. He sees the destination. He sees what's around the curve. And walking in faith in that way implies that um, while we wonder about the future, we don't necessarily worry or stress out about it because we know who holds the future. And I'll leave that as a word for, for all of us and maybe especially for you six youth who are being baptized here today. There's an element of trust um, that comes into full effect because um, we can't see around the bend. Well, I think we're at the point now where uh, the um, youth will give their testimonies here. Uh, Jamie and Real, Wendell Kaufman, Tyler Kaufman, Daniel Lapp, Deanna Miller, and Larissa Bang have requested um, baptism. And in our church, we uh, automatically receive church membership at baptism. And so they have uh, agreed to uh, share their testimony. And I think it's one of the most important parts of our service here today. And um, I just want you to... Um, uh, you youth to um, do the best you can, and I know that you will do as well. Uh, you, you'll do fine. And um, so, yeah, all of us together, we can uh, think of commitments that we're making or have made in our lives, and uh, I just encourage you to, um, um, at the end of services, you'll be given an opportunity to bless them and encourage them, and, and um, yeah, so... Jamie, I think we'll uh, have you go first. First off, I would just like to thank everybody for coming out today This and supporting us. This is a really big step in our lives, and I know that there have been a lot of people praying for us, and it really does mean a lot as we make this commitment to be a part of the church and to... Uh, have a symbolism to the whole world that we are part of Christ. There are so many emotions running through myself. I'm not exactly sure how to express myself right now, but I would like to first of all thank my parents for just their leadership and um, their individual impact in my life. They've really meant a lot, and if they had not been here to... From my youngest days up, you know, teach me the Bible and help me daily as 
on my walk through Christ, and there's no way that I could be where I am today. So I just want to thank them for that, and you really do mean a lot in my life. Another group of people that I would really like to thank at this time would be my teachers. Through my life, I have had multiple men and women that have went out of their way to teach me and help me grow both mentally and spiritually. Whether it be through Sunday school or grade school, the impact that godly teachers have had on my life is more than many of them will ever imagine. And so use, to use today, I would just like to say thank you because it really has meant a lot in my life. Another group that I would like to thank would be my preachers individually for the effort that you have not only put into this church, but into us as six um, young youth. It really has meant a lot and teaching us to see clear what it has meant to be a child of Christ. I know personally that, that that has challenged me in many ways. As for my personal testimony, I don't remember a lot of it, but I was about seven years old and I remember take, talking to my mom after an evening service. I remember us talking and then her praying with me then asking me if I also wanted to pray. Although that was not the last time that my mother and I talked about salvation, it was the first that I can comprehend, and I'm really appreciative for that. Even though I'm not, a, not fully, a, even though I was not fully aware what being a Christian really meant at that time, and still do not nearly understand everything, I do understand that it is more than just going through the motions and saying the right things but rather it is believing that Christ is who he said he is and therefore living accordingly. So as we take these steps forward in our lives, I would just like to say I am so thankful to God, to the God we serve, is that the God we serve is loving enough to send his son specifically for me and not me, just me, but all of us. That I am willing to be baptized to make an announcement that I belong to Christ. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer my foot to be moved. He that keepeth me will not slumber. Thank you. When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell's, hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and, my, and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. 2 Samuel 22, 5-7. Good morning. These three verses have, are my, have been my favorite for a long time. They show to me that no matter what is happening to us, um, doesn't matter what is happening in our lives or anything, He'll be there for us and keeping us safe. This was especially comforting me as we are getting ready to move to Connecticut. Um, something that's going to be that's hard for me to leave everything here. Um, it was just real comforting to know, comforting to know that he was here for everything that's happening, and he'll be there with me too. A few people I'd like to thank would be my eighth grade teacher, um, Christopher Lapp. His Bible classes were the best and were such a blessing to me in all ways, in every way that possible. His, uh, he took his time to help us understand better if we had questions. He did everything possible to get us closer to God, and I want to thank him so much for that. I'd also like to thank my pastors and Sunday school teachers. The way they have helped me in every way is amazing. The knowledge that they gave to me in their classes and through sermons was a great blessing. Their willingness to answer questions and to help you through troubles was also a great blessing. Lastly, I'd like to thank my parents and family for their love, care, and support they've given to me throughout the years. The, in way, they have blessed me in ways you cannot imagine, and I am so thankful th that I have a family for them. So final verses that brought comfort to me and hope are 2 Samuel 22, 18 through 19. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hunted, hunted me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. Thank you.
um, 2 Peter 3, verse 18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the pastors for all they have done for me and us others in the instruction class the last couple months, and also for those that prayed for us. Um, I would also like to thank teachers and those in my life that have really um, went out of their way to teach me. Um, some verses that I really like is, one is Second Peter, um, which I read, and Isaiah 40, 31 says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They, should, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They should run and not be weary. They should walk and not grow faint. Thank you. For God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This verse became special to me while, not, while I was quizzing in my sixth grade year. It is special to me in two ways. One, when I'm down, I turn to this verse to receive strength from God. Two, because it shows that no negative thought comes from God, but from, but from Satan. Um, when I was around seven or eight, I received the Lord as my savior, but it wasn't till eighth grade that Jesus Christ became real and alive to me, thanks to my eighth grade teacher, Mr. Lapp. I also want to thank my parents for helping me on my journey, and also, my, and also Dottie Lapp for encouraging me to Bible quiz. But I want to especially thank the Lord, as it says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For, for by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because I love this verse because by myself I can never earn my salvation. But only because Jesus died on the cross may I become a true believer. Thank you all for coming out and supporting my decision to follow Christ and be baptized and also to become a member of the church. Several people who have encouraged me during my experience with Christ is my, I would like to thank my parents for encouraging me and helping me to make the right decisions. Decisions that, fo that help me focus on God and my spiritual walk with him. I would also like to thank each one of the pastors for the, all the hard work they do to make this possible and especially Nate Bang for the many lessons he taught us in instruction class and for the amount of effort he put into the teaching. I accepted Christ as my savior on March, tw on March 12, 2012. I was listening to the Bible story tape of the writing on the wall, and I decided right then that I wanted to be a Christian. So me and my parents prayed, and the joy that I felt afterward is unexplainable. I'm going to end with a few of my favorite verses from Isaiah. Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no mighty and to them that have no might, he increases he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I became a Christian when I was 11. I wasn't fulfilled in life, and I wanted something more. I went to mom and dad, and they helped me through the sinner's prayer. Since then, there have been many ups and downs, but through it all, God has been faithful. Thank you all for coming out to support us today. Your prayers mean a lot. Thank you, mom and dad, for all the time you put into instruction class and always being willing to, willing to answer our questions. Thanks to each one of you in instruction class um, for all you did for me. You mean a lot, and I'm praying for you. And most of all, thank you, God, for your grace and unconditional love for us. Some verses that have meant a lot to me recently are Isaiah 41, 1 to 3. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. now to proceed with the uh, baptism, and I'll ask uh, John to uh, join me here to assist in the baptism, and uh, we'll just uh, take a few minutes here, and then we'll be ready to proceed.
go ahead and stand up. You might as well move over to the side here. Can't take on the other side here. All right, I invite you to kneel. Jamie and Real, do you believe in the one true, eternal, and almighty God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of mankind? Do you believe in the Holy Ghost which proceeds from the Father and the Son? Are you truly sorry for your past sins, and are you willing to renounce Satan, the world, all the works of darkness, and your own carnal will and sinful desires? Do you confess and declare that you have experienced a new birth? I do. Do you promise by the grace of God and the aid of the Holy Spirit to submit yourself to Christ, his word, and his church, and to faithfully abide in the same the rest of your life? Jamian, upon your confession of faith and your commitment before God and these witnesses, we baptize you with water in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. May God fill you with joy and peace. Wendell Kaufman, do you believe in the one true, eternal, and almighty God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of mankind? Do you believe in the Holy Ghost which proceeds from the Father and the Son? Are you truly sorry for your past sins, and are you willing to renounce Satan, the world, all the works of darkness and your own carnal will and sinful desires. Do you confess and do you declare and confess that you have experienced a new birth? Do you promise by the grace of God and the aid of the Holy Spirit to submit yourself to Christ, His Word, and His Church, and to faithfully abide in the same the rest of your life? Wendell, upon your confession of faith, and your commitment before God and these witnesses. We baptize you with water in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. May God fill you with joy and peace. <clears throat> Tyler Kaufman, do you believe in the one true eternal and Almighty God. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of mankind? Do you believe in the Holy Ghost which proceeds from the Father and the Son? Are you truly sorry for your past sins and are you willing to renounce Satan, the world, all the works of darkness and your own carnal will and sinful desires. Do you declare and confess that you have experienced a new birth? Do you promise by the grace of God and the aid of the Holy Spirit to submit yourself to Christ, his word and his church and to faithfully abide in the same the rest of your life? Tyler, upon your confession of faith, and your commitment before God and these witnesses, we baptize you with water in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. May God fill you with joy and peace. <clears throat> Daniel Lapp. Do you believe in the one true, eternal, and almighty God? I do. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of mankind? I do. 
Do you believe in the Holy Ghost, which proceeds from the Father and the Son? Are you truly sorry for your past sins, and are you willing to renounce Satan, the world, all the works of darkness, and your own carnal will and sinful desires? Do you declare and confess that you have experienced the new birth? Do you promise by the grace of God and the aid of the Holy Spirit to submit yourself to Christ, his word, and his church, and to faithfully abide in the same the rest of your life? Daniel, upon your confession of faith and your commitment before God and these witnesses, we baptize you with water in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. May God fill you with joy and peace. Deanna Miller, do you believe in the one true, eternal, and almighty God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of mankind? Do you believe in the Holy Ghost which proceeds from the Father and the Son? Are you truly sorry for your past sins, and are you willing to renounce Satan, the world, all the works of darkness, and your own carnal will and sinful desires? Do you declare and confess that you have experienced the new birth? Do you promise by the grace of God and the aid of the Holy Spirit to submit yourself to Christ, his word, and his church, and to faithfully abide in the same the rest of your life. Deanna, upon your confession of faith and your commitment before God and these witnesses, we baptize you with water in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. May God fill you with joy and peace. Larissa Bang, do you believe in the one true, eternal, and almighty God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of mankind? Do you believe in the Holy Ghost, which proceeds from the Father and the Son? Are you truly sorry for your past sins? And are you willing to renounce Satan, the world, all the works of darkness, and your own carnal will and sinful desires? Do you declare and confess that you have experienced a new birth? Do you promise by the grace of God and the aid of the Holy Spirit to submit yourself to Christ, his word, and his church, and to faithfully abide in the same the rest of your life? Larissa, upon your commitment, upon your confession of faith and your commitment before God and these witnesses, we baptize you with water in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. May God fill you with joy and peace. Damien, in the name of Jesus Christ and the church, I give you my hand to receive you as a brother in the church. I welcome you as a member of the Weavertown Church. <clears throat> Wendell, in the name of Jesus Christ and the church, I give you my hand to receive you as a brother in the church. Welcome to the Weavertown Church as a member of God. Tyler, in the name of Jesus Christ and the church, I give you my hand to receive you as a brother in the church and as a member of the Weavertown Church. Daniel, in the name of Jesus Christ and the church, I give you my hand to receive you as a brother and a member of the Weavertown Church. God bless. Deanna, in the name of Jesus Christ and the church, I give you my hand to receive you as a member and a sister in the church. God bless you. 
Larissa, in the name of Jesus Christ and the church, I give you my hand to receive you as a sister and a member of the Weavertown Church. God bless you. Well, thank you to each of you for your, um, the good job you did in presenting your testimonies. I'm very excited and happy for you and uh, just want to commit myself as um, a pastor or your pastor to do what I can to support you and to bless you and to make your life a blessing to others and to point you in, the, in a good direction. God has given you talents and abilities that are um, actually fairly noticeable, and I just want to uh, encourage you the best I can to um, use those, to um, practice those, to um, uh, find a way to exercise a gift, your gift, in, in this church and in your school and wherever you go. I think I'll have the uh, sound, uh, one of the sound guys come up here with the uh, microphone at this time. And we'll invite the uh, fathers to uh, um, give their personal blessing to their child. Uh, following that, uh, anyone else, um, I'll give some time for anyone else to um, share something that you'd like. Uh, no obligation necessarily, but if you are here and you've been blessed or want to share some blessing or anything else that's on your mind in relation to the sermon or something else that you want to share publicly, uh, you'll be invited to do so. Um, I don't know, maybe it would make about as much sense to just kind of start on this side, Elmer, um, Sylvan, and then we'll kind of um, work our way across here. Well, thanks to you, Jamie, for the uh, decision, commitment that you've made. Uh, it is pretty exciting to see what you've been doing in our home in the, in the past few months and so forth. As our family gets older, as our children get older, it's exciting to see what each individual one brings to our family. And as Dave said, uh, you have a gift and I invite you to exercise that gift as God gives it to you. I know that for you in, in your life right now, you're pretty excited about life. And I'm excited for you. Uh, I know that you're young. You have a lot of dreams, and that's exciting for me. I was thinking about just a real little illustration that I can give you, uh, maybe as to where you are in your in your life. I think it's fair to say that you're a young Christian. And as I think about that, I think of building a home, I think of building a, a building, and I think the illustration is pretty practical. One of the most important things is the foundation. And I do think that you're probably in that stage of your life where you're putting down the foundation. And I think we all know that in a foundation, it's very important that we use right material. If you would walk into our basement, if you'd walk into any basement, you would notice that the basement is, is made of, of blocks and of concrete for the most part. And I think it would be pretty catching. I think it would be pretty obvious if you walked into a basement and instead of a course of block, about three or four or five courses are in the middle, there would be a course of hard dirt chunks or something like that. I think we would all recognize that and say that's not a good foundation and it's probably not going to hold up. So I challenge you all that in this time that you would consider uh, your decisions, consider uh, life even as excited and even as prime as you are, that you would use the right ingredients. And, and I really, really think that um, you haven't been given everything, but I know that Nate has instructed you very well. I know that your teachers have taught you a lot. And as parents, I hope that, you know, our input 
in the stress and everyday life that, that we too could have had an impact on you. And that's to God's glory. So just, yeah, thank you again. And uh, thanks to you as pastors for a lot of work that you put into not only Jamie's life, but into each one of our families. Um, so may God just bless you as you go from here and be excited, but uh, just consider as you lay down the foundation of your Christian life that you use what is going to be able to stand up to the storms that come in life so that we can one day um, experience that blessed reward that God has for us. Thank you. I want to say thank you um, for this day. Um, it made, it's rich for us, and um, I just want to bless Wendell and, and his life as he um, goes from here and goes to another area later this, this summer. And um, we want, we're looking forward to that as well. We want to thank you for um, you pastors, for what you have done for um, our children and uh, the way that we can work together in bringing honor and glory to God. exciting to be here this morning, um, see you as youth willing to stand up and give your testimony and um, be leaders. Um, it's exciting to think about you in the future being the next generation of leaders um, in our church, in our community, in our um, world that we live in. Um, God's called each one of you to be leaders, and God wants each one of you to stand up for what's right. I remember quite a few years back, uh, we were in the car one day, my wife and I were talking, and um, we were talking about doing what God has called us to do, and I don't know if it was sounding a little bit like complaining or what it was, but Daniel, at that time, you said, Dad, didn't you call all of us to be leaders? Um, and I'll never forget that. I think um, I want to remind you again this morning that God called, yes, us to be leaders, but you, each one of you, to be leaders in him. And I want to bless you, Daniel, as you walk in God, and um, as you walk in him and I want to encourage you to be a leader um, wherever you're at um, standing for truth and stand, being willing to do what's right I know from a young age um, you always wanted to follow God and I remember especially the last couple of years um, eighth grade especially you standing up and studying um, the word and being willing to dig into truth and understand what truth is and I encourage you to keep doing that um, in the future and I think God has a special place for each one of you in the class here this morning I look forward to seeing what God has for you. Larissa, your mom and I affirm you in what you're doing here this morning and in your life. We love you. And I think of the words of God when Jesus was baptized, we are well pleased. Uh, we've enjoyed watching your life. You have lots of talents. We enjoy the music you make watching you interact with children and other people. Um, school seems to go well. It, it seems sometimes like whatever life throws at you, you just can handle pretty well. And I want to encourage you to use your talents for God, but at the same time, to not depend on them because God is the one who will carry you through and just keep looking to him. We love you. I'm grateful to share this day with Tyler, and um, I appreciate the challenge to uh, walk the right path, to uh, be connected to the power, and uh, do, people, do people recognize our walk? Uh, I particularly want to recognize and thank Nate for his time and energy um, that he put into this class, and it, it doesn't go unnoticed. Um, also grateful for family and, and friends that are here to share this day with, with Tyler. That's appreciated, too. Tyler, we, um, we bless you. We, we're grateful that you 
made this uh, choice, this decision. Um, I challenge you to, to choose right friends, to, to make right choices in life. Um, remember this day and, and, and look back. Um, use it as a, a foundation, a, a stepping stone. Um, life won't always be easy. Um, I encourage you to, to, to follow the Lord Jesus. Um, it's, it's exciting to have you in our lives. Uh, we're grateful to God and, and uh, um, to, to see the, the young man that you're becoming. We love you. A few years ago, um, Deanna introduced a new phrase into our home. If I was uh, waxing poetic or coming up with too many details or being long-winded, she would just say, Dad, nobody cares. And uh, that's kind of her personality. She's not real concerned about details. Um, and if she's making supper, it's best to stay out of the kitchen if you don't want the noodles on you. Um, so some may interpret that as a weakness, but I think that can also be a strength. And I'd like to encourage you, Deanna, to, uh, in your relationship with God, to dive in, um, choose the path, and allow him to work out the details. All right. Uh, those were the fathers. Uh, anyone else can get up and uh, um, share something, like I suggested earlier. If you would like to take the opportunity, opportunity to do that, now is your time. Who's first? Well, Daniel and Deanna, it's exciting for me to be here and see what your the commitment you made here today. What's really exciting, you had a lot of the decisions that you could have made, but you made this decision. We bless you for that. I have one verse for you. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. You know, God is going to continue to do a lot for you if you commit your ways to him. It's been a blessing to be here today. Um, seeing Tyler give his testimony brought back memories to me. Um, some memories of things that I saw from my office window when uh, Ryan and Tyler were just little guys. Tyler, one of the things I remember about you when I'd um, sometimes get distracted from my work and just watch was that you could never hold still. Uh, it seemed like uh, not even for five seconds uh, when you were out there. I just want to encourage you to, to use that energy that you have uh, and uh, put it to use for God's glory. But then, after a while, I saw you doing some things that I thought, that will never work for Tyler. Do um, you remember when you and Ryan built uh, blinds in the garden uh, close to the fence? And uh, you hid in those blinds with your um, rubber band guns, uh, waiting for sparrows to come to the fence to shoot? Uh, Tyler will never be able to hold still long enough to shoot a spare. Well, he actually hit one a time or so, I think, or it got really close. <laughs> Tyler, uh, you know, there are times in life when, when we need to hold still. And uh, you're not just in uh, when you're hunting, but other times too. Uh, remember to hold still and listen to God. And you know, I want to bless you making a decision like this is real good. Uh, I just want to say, and we heard a good message today to follow the path, follow the path of Jesus. <laughs> Stay on that straight and narrow path and put on the whole armor of God and he will, he will sustain and keep you. Thank you. Marisa, I uh, <clears throat> don't know how to bring this out the way you helped at our house. 
and especially the many times that Grandma was gone, you were around to help me, and especially when it was necessary. And my, I still appreciate all the help that comes from the children with my legs and the problems I have. So thank you and praise you, especially girls, uh, when you come there, especially Larissa and the sisters. Oh, Daniel, I'm really proud of you joining this church. Um, I remember a couple of years ago when I joined, uh, it was about three years ago, and I, I was pretty young, and I realized uh, I can't really, I thought I couldn't really um, affect the church at such a young age. And I'm just, this is just a challenge for all you guys. You can affect the church at your age. You're, um, you're being watched by other youth, and when you join the youth group, you can, um, yeah, you can just put into the youth group. It's, we watch you guys, and we want you guys to be a witness for Christ. So, yeah, you can do stuff for Christ, even at a young age. been a blessing to be here this morning and and Tyler I want to bless you with the decision you have made to follow Christ and and seek out what he has for you and your life and I just had to uh, think also what grandpa said if you take the energies and the challenges that lay before you in life and you put your determination into the energies that you have. Rely on God and rely on Christ to lead you and walk in that. And the other thing I had to think of this morning for you as a class, never underestimate how blessed, how privileged you are to be raised in Christian homes and and being brought to church and having a mom and dad that love you. And as you go forth in life, that you can also be an encouragement to those who are out in the world to accept Christ as their Savior and for all of us to take that challenge with us. Thank you. Thank you, Nate, for your message. Uh, Reminded me of the uh, power that we have, and Deanna, for you. Um, well, for me, first of all, I, I always liked John Deere's. I thought they had a lot of power. There's people here that would argue with me and say, no, it was internationals. The one thing I want to leave with you is that you have the greatest power to hold on to that ever existed. And I encourage you to do that as you go through life. Are there more? There's one. I'd like to welcome each of you six to the Weaver Town family. I think sometimes we almost forget how special it is to be part of this church. And I don't know, I just had a daughter, Adriel. She's five months old now. But in a lot of ways, you're like, um, you're newly born into our, our family. This is a family here. And Adriel took a lot of love and care, and she doesn't contribute a lot to the family at this point. Um, so couple lessons, I guess, from that. I think us and the rest of the church, we should stand behind each of these young Christians. And yeah, but it's really exciting to have you join us. And there's something, yeah, I guess I already said that, but we sometimes forget 
how special it is to belong to a church family. And Weavertown is a really cool family to be part of. Um, so you're very fortunate in that. The other thing I want to say is that, to each of you six, is that your commitment to Christ did not go unnoticed in the spirit realm. So we owe it to you to keep praying for you, but also each of you keep your guards up. Um, it's pretty exciting. Thank you. We have time for more. If somebody would like to do it, uh, stand up. All right, I'm going to invite uh, Norman to come forward and uh, say what he'd like to say and then close the service as he chooses. So, Norman. I'll be making just a few comments and then giving the benediction. And then after that, Virgil, if you would lead us in a song or a verse of song, to, and we'll end this special time um, this morning singing praise together. I thank you that you have chosen you six. You've chosen the path of the just and you've been on that path for a little while already and it just could be that that path will stretch out for a long time yet. And as I thought of that you being on the path of just, I thought of a song, a poem, a song, and I, I'd like just to think about this a little bit. Uh, first verse talks about lots of sunlight uh, in the path. The second verse talks about shadows. You know, today is a day of great sunlight and rejoicing for you and for all of us together, but there will be some shadows at times. The third stanza wonderfully talks about the mansions above. That's where that the path of the just ends. And thank God that we have the hope of heaven, the hope of those mansions above at the end of this path of the just. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep veil. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Second stanza, shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my savior and guide. He is the light, in him is no darkness, ever I'm walking close to his side. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, Gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Will you stand with me for the benediction, please? And this benediction you've heard before, I especially dedicate these verses in Hebrews 13 to you six um, to make that personal for your life as we go from here. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And if you will remain standing for the song, when we're finished singing, you can consider yourselves dismissed. Take the first and the last verse, and they'll be picking up the chairs in the foyer, so 